Sometimes it's easy to forget that all business problems are essentially people problems. Work is just a setting for humans to act out our dramas, to express and excel, learn and grow, to fight and find ourselves. Often the language and frameworks we use to describe this struggle in organizational life is paired back to a sterile set of cliches lacking emotional meaning and humanity. More leaders recognize this and are trying to find ways to ground themselves and their teams in more human connectedness. In this show, we talk to the poet Pele Cox about her life and how she works in organizations to rekindle our souls at work. We start with Pele reading one of her poems. Spectacle. If I wore glasses, darling, I would only take them off for you. Remove the delicate circles of glass trapped by wire, just like you do, and give the pub their frames for an hour, while we two sat with nude eyes, busy being seen by the one other thing that knew. Mm, that's beautiful. Hey folks, welcome back to the Evolving Leader Podcast. I'm Scott Allender. And I'm John Gomes. How are you feeling on this Friday, Mr. Gomes? Ah, I am feeling I'm feeling very relaxed in, in the company of our guest, and I'm feeling quite lyrical. <laughs> ah. Yes. How are you feeling? Um I'm just trying to picture you being lyrical. I'm feeling Physically tired because I've been running up and down the steps trying to get my Wi-Fi to cooperate. So if I bounce in and out of this recording, you'll know why. Uh, emotionally, I'm feeling uh, just a lot of gratitude. It's been a really, really positive week. Very busy, but a lot of good things happening. And I'm just feeling feeling re- really grateful and grateful to be here again with you and talking to our guests because today we are joined by Pele Cox. Pele is a creative writing and literature tutor, poet, and dramaturgist. After an MA in creative writing, under the tutelage of Andrew Motion, the then poet laureate, Pele became a poet and resident at Tate Modern, the Royal Academy, Keats Shelley House, and British School at Rome, where she founded the creative writing program. Since 2015, she has worked with companies such as PwC, Nielsen, and a clutch of hedge funds, tutoring leaders and employees in creative innovation. She believes that the workplace can function as a creative space for employees through the study of literature and a solid writing practice. Her students convert their personal experiences and ideals into a more connected and empowering work life while becoming more effective writers and speakers at work. Pele, we are so excited to be talking to you. Welcome to The Evolving Leader. Thank you very much for having me. Those two words I love, evolving and leader, especially when they're applied to poetry. Mm. <laughs> thank you for coming on the show today. How are you feeling? I'm feeling great, thank you. Um, what's been going on? I got back from Rome yesterday, um, where my husband, who is a professor, is doing some work on architecture and poetry. Um, mm. So Scott gave us a little bit of your kind of CV. Can you um, just give us some edited highlights of your journey as an artist? Sure. I noticed you say artist, and I think... In my, in my case, that's particularly interesting because um, I've always called myself a poet because I've been surrounded by artists. So if I called myself an artist, I would have been drowned at an early age. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've grown up in the arts. Um, my, fa- my father's a well-known sculptor. My, my uncle's a well-known opera director. I, I've, I've been enriched by this extraordinary talent that, around me. And uh, what it's given me is not an interest in my own talent, whether I have any or not, but an interest in the talent and the connectivity and the practices of the great artists and the creative spirit that is in all of us. And was there, a, a, I mean, you grew up in a very rich creative environment, but was there a moment where you went, yeah, this is, I want to be a poet? 
Yes, it was when I fell in love with the barman I was working with at the Slug and Lettuce pub, age 18. (laughs) Um, uh, Nothing could contain my love for him. So I I, I found that the empty page in a biro was was the only way to, to frame it. Yeah. And did it did it work? Yes, it did. The, the relationship didn't <laughs> last. <laughs> it opened the door on you know the eternity of the of the white space and um, a love for other people's appreciation of poetry and a love for the great dead poets and a love for mm. the arts and a love for collaboration. Yeah. Who are some of your favorite poets? Well, my my most favorite still. Um, because they change every day, obviously, as our moods do and our situation and experience, mm-hmm. is Tennyson, because um, my mother used to read us Tennyson when we were very little as a bedtime story, and the poem by Tennyson that I still love the most is The Lady of Shalott, Every Little Girl's Dream. I don't know if you know the story, but it's about a woman who lives in a tower in Camelot who's been cursed and can only see the world through on through a mirror of the outside world reflected in a mirror in her tower um, because if she looks out the window she will the curse will come upon her and so she sews this tapestry of what she sees in the mirror of the world going along outside um don't forget Camelot that's obviously king arthur's um venue and um one day she sees Lancelot riding by and she falls in love with him and she can't sit there anymore and she leaps out of her chair and across the room and out the door and down into the world um, um, to find Lancelot. And I won't tell you what happens because (laughs) that would mean you wouldn't read the poem. (laughs) I'll definitely read it. So um, before we get into some of the things that you've done in... uh, taking poetry as a, a way of helping leaders and organizations think about things differently. What, what's, what is your creative process? Good question. And thanks for including my creative process in, that, in those words. I left UEA, where Andrew Motion taught me, and I'd been writing a bit of poetry, and um, it was quite good. And um, I didn't want to go out into the world and start just um, writing poems in in the hope that magazine, poetry magazines would want to publish my work because my poems weren't very narrative or they wouldn't have been fashionable back then. So I decided that poetry in its history had had a great place in the cultural landscape and that I looked around me in the 1990s and saw that everyone was standing down in these caverns in London in Birkenstocks reading poetry to each other and that was great I mean it was sexy back then to stand up and read your work together in an intimate environment but what interested me more was to take poetry back into these institutions and museums where it had always had a place in the great artists lives and imagination and just put myself there and be poet in residence and say poetry is important and it needs to be here under this roof so um, I set about interviewing artists like Louise Bourgeois was on show there when I became poet in residence at Tate. And um, I went to interview her in New York. She was still alive then. And she held a, po- um, a, a salon in her studio and anyone could come along. And uh, she was very old back then. And I walked in and she looked like a sphinx. She looked so powerful and so extraordinary. And I nervously said, I, I was, there were six of us, um, would you, would I, can I read you one of my poems, please? So I read her out this poem, and she started to do a drawing. And it was, like, it was a life-changing moment for me, because it, not only did it prove my point, but also it helped me to understand how I could take this idea further. Um, of course, I desperately wanted to ask her if I could take the drawing home, but because I'm a well-brought-up artist's <laughs> daughter, I didn't. Then I applied to the the Royal Academy of Arts to be poet in residence there. I mean, there wasn't a post going. I'm I'm quite bold. So I just write to these institutions and say, can I come along? And because I'd done well at the Tate, they wanted me at the Royal Academy. And instead of writing my my own poetry about the pictures on the walls, I thought um, that would be boring for everyone. 
So I'd investigate the great artists on show and their relationship to poetry. And the first artist on show there was Van Gogh. And I felt like I'd struck gold because I was researching all his letters and in amongst all those beautiful sentiments and letters he writes, there is references to a lot of great poets. Uh, Longfellow, Christina Rossetti, Shakespeare. So I constructed a script um, for an audience, public audience, which, which brought out this element of his, of his understanding of other arts. Very, he was very multidisciplinary. And, um, and I got three actors to perform this script, and it was like the internal life of Vincent van Gogh had appeared in front of, you, in front of us all. Um, and what came to light was how these poems had been a balm for his mental torment and the way that they were affecting us would have been the way that they would have affected him. So there was this great sort of sense of harmony across the ages and across uh, this the spirit of all of us, but most of all, this great, great artist who lived in such torment. Mm -hmm. So then I just thought, well, <laughs> surely if he's reading these poems and it's having this effect on him then we can all read these poems and it has a similar effect on us and that our creativity can be enhanced and emerge, you know, stronger and more eloquent with the reading of it. So, and then I thought, well, let's take it into business. Why not? And I've done lots of workshops in the spirit of that. Before we get to that, would you mind sharing some of your poetry with us now? We'd love to hear a couple of couple of them if you have if you're willing yeah i'll start with one um that is just and it's topical because it's featured in this um new anthology that just came out yesterday which is edited by a, a, a woman called rachel kelly and it's called you'll never walk alone and um it's about a poem for every season afterwards afterwards he says, it would be good to find a woman as bright as me. She uncurls, thinks, not unlike burial lying here before light comes. The room so black, a charcoal smear, him, her, ash, bone, a cigarette, and where on earth to go from here. Hmm. So, what's going on there, Pelly? Help us. <laughs> well, I wrote that poem 25 years ago. Uh, say it's my juvenilia. And um, it's about an ex-boyfriend. And um, I wrote it because he said, post-coitally, it would be good to find a woman as bright as me. And I thought that was quite the <laughs> rudest thing <laughs> you could say to your girlfriend of two years. Um, it wasn't like I just met him and he didn't know how clever I was. And uh, so um, I just simply wrote it down and added this, the, 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 the language of my experience of someone saying something hurtful. Um, and it, it was, it's very brief because it's about the dark and there's lots of spaces in it. Although at the same time it speaks to lots of women, people. And it's, it, it's not... It's, it's quite timeless. I, f I find 25 years later, it still stands up. It's lovely. So just coming back to this conversation about your process, it's n not obvious as a, you know, to, to, the, to most people that a poet can use poetry in so many different ways in, in how you're describing it. So you're looking at it from a very broad range of, of perspectives, how other people experience poetry, how poetry influences you, how it can be seen in different settings and so on. There's, there feels like there's a lot of different ways in which you could take that. How did you get to that? Um, because you know the ego, in, uh, as an artist, is often driving a lot of what's going on. Um, you know, my my desire for self-expression. 
Um, it doesn't feel like that's the primary driving force here at all. It feels like it's a totally different thing that's going on. I'm just fascinated by that. I do have an ego. You know, I've written some stuff and I... And I'm really proud of it. And, you know, you ask me to stand up and read it and I'll do it to a room full of 100 people. But there's a lot of that going around. And I think I can give something else. There's something else that interests me more, which is the magic, the key between this great untapped realm of great, great work, great words, great, great personalities who suffered you know, and endured this profound experience. And that if, I feel like I'm a translator in a way, mm. not of their work, but of their, their importance. And if I can use that as a poet, I can, I can do that good in the, you know, in this, this, this crazy landscape we're all living in. And I, pref I prefer that. Um, what, do, what happens when you take your experience into the hedge fund <laughs> audience what what's going on there what what happens i know it's crazy isn't it because it's like the hedge funds that that that, I, that um denomination it's the sort of zenith of the craziness of this idea isn't it and it was but it was the inspiration in a way i mean everything i've come into contact with has been the inspiration because nothing to me is confined you know, everything is to play for and everything is, can be framed by a creative spirit. So, you know, give me a challenge. Give me a room of hedge funders and, you know, within two weeks I'll all be reading poetry when on the tube on the way home. Even the hedge funders, I suppose, is how I should say that. But um, I came across them because when I got back from Venice Beach, where I used to live, I was a bit lost and... Uh, I heard, I went to a party and there was a guy there. The other interesting thing is that when you, this is everyone talking about poetry now, but like 12 years ago, if you went to a party and you said you're a poet, everyone looked at you like you were some strange bird that had walked in, you know, mm. like what's that, what's not that kind of bird, I mean, you know, <laughs> with a strange plumage. And this guy was telling me his poetry story. And he said, oh, that's funny, because I was on this radio show the other day for hedge funders, and there was a, they had people reading poetry on there. So I was like, oh, what's his name? Um, what's his number? Do you think he'd like me to go on and read it? And he went, yeah, I expect so. So I rang him up. And within a month, I was sitting there in this tiny studio in uh, London Bridge, and Res the Resonance FM studio, surrounded by six hedge funders with this... Um, hedge funder who runs the whole show called Stuart McDonald, who's amazing, and reading my poetry. And the response from them was so electric. You know, they really loved it. And we all went to the pub afterwards and they were like asking me about it and they all had, you know, they all had a, a literary sense. They all had a literary past. They all had, you know, a language that wasn't just the language of money. Yeah, I mean, listening to you speak about it, 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 it sounds so normal, but this stuff's not happening in the world. I mean, this is really a very different entrepreneurial kind of idea you had. And I was reading some of the remarks from a few of your corporate clients and was actually moved by much of the feedback. One example is someone who wrote, Pele has the unique gift of connecting with you and seeing in you what you can't see in yourself and thereby enabling your true pro poetic voice. It's thanks to her that I've found mine. And there are so many others who left really complimentary reviews of their time with you. And again, this isn't the type of work you see people you know, being done in the world. So I'd love to know when you're walking into an organization or sitting with a leader, what does that process really look like? What, is, what does it look like to work with them and help them find their poetic voice? And why is it so important? It looks like a, a, a small studio in London Bridge with um, eight hedge funders whose the watches on their wrists are probably worth more money than the whole studio, the mm. whole building. And that uh, I have this conviction, um, which is so strong, that I know that I can, I can offer this collection of words that is more valuable, more precious, more influential, more, more enduring 
then then those watches on their wrists, then that then the conversation then the, the thoughts they're thinking when they walk in. I can help them to think different thoughts on when they walk out. Not to say they have to so the, the, the challenge is I'm not saying they have to put any of those thoughts down. I'm just saying that the that the processes, the word bag, the the emotional in, intelligence, the responses to their experiences become can become so much more eloquent with a, a collection of poems by T. S. Eliot in their bag or and Maya Angelou's, you know, I know why the cage bird sings swimming round their thoughts on the way home from work hmm. actually i have a friend who's a hedge funder who has a daughter who loves poetry and i he said she just loves books Pele. she loves books and i said i'll send her a book list if you like and i of course at the top i put a rattle bag which is an anthology of poems by ted hughes and seamus heaney who were great friends it's their choice of all the great poems and then uh six weeks later he said to me I'm in Abu Dhabi doing some business, and she's in Essex where we live, and every night now I'm away, she reads me a poem from this book over the phone. Mm. That's that amazing. kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. That's wonderful. And he can't believe it. He's like, oh my God, this is like some crazy magic secret you've given me. It's not my magic secret. Well, I, I just asked the question of half a dozen people before we came on the show. Do you read poetry? And only one person out of that, and it's a tiny little cross sample, but, but most people said, no, I tried at school. I never really, never really got it. Um, so people have, I think, a perception of poetry that it's elitist or difficult or you know, help us understand a little bit more about how to, to rethink that and get the value from, from this art form. Sure. It's very complicated. It's like the fear, the fear around other disciplines or the boundaries are high. You know, I think the past 25 years, everything's become quite pigeonholed. And, you know, that's not to say that that there's not this great multidisciplinary um, new world that we live in. But I think it's as if people think they're being, they're removing the boundaries between things, but actually the walls are getting higher. You know, that's one of the things you can really understand in poetry. Those things can happen at the same time. And when I went to PwC, um, I did a, t- a pre-dinner. They wanted me to do a pre-dinner talk and an after-dinner talk. I was it was terrifying. I couldn't I couldn't get through the main course because I I'd given my talk about how important language was and creativity was, and I thought I'd said it all. But then I they wanted me to stand up again. Now that's partly because I think when you start talking from a po- poetry point of view, I'm not saying poetic because that's something people get mixed up about I think and that's partly where the fear comes in is that poetry is not about being poetic you know it's not like people always think that I sit around looking out my window and waiting for the sun to rise I'm much more I have to be very pragmatic as a poet and 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 Keats said that poets are not poetic they're vessels for what's poetic Mm. they carry the poetic nature of the world around inside them There's no room for us to be poetic as well. (laughs) And, you know, the reason that we write these beautiful things is because we're almost vessels. So when I write a poem, it's not because I've been thinking about it all day or planning it or anything. It's just something comes over me that needs to be said. And I'm the one that knows how to write it down simply and clearly. So anyway, I, I, I did this talk, and then the reason I was there was to do a workshop with some of the partners of PwC afterwards. And the, the brief of the workshop was very simple, because I also understand that what John says about people feeling intimidated. You know, if, I, if I'd said, oh, I'm going to come along and talk to you about Keats, you know, everyone would have run for the hill. So I know that you have to let the 
your your students be in control of the process and the brief. So I just said, just bring each one of you bring along a poem or piece of writing that you like. That's all you have to do. It means something to you. And there must have been 25 people sat in a circle. And um, I, I just start and said to the first one, okay, read, re read us the poem you bought and tell us why you bought it. And about five people into the process, it's like the whole world has changed. Um, one person's bought a you know, great speech by uh, Horace that he loves, because you know, he did classics at Oxford. And the, girl, the woman next to him has bought, no, a bloke next to him has bought his favourite um, verse from Winnie the Pooh. And then someone next to that's bought Caroline Duffy. And someone next to them has bought, you know, um, a bit of Shakespeare. Someone next to that um, recited the lines of the tattoo she had, you know, tattooed along her back. Uh, and it was very moving. It was almost too moving, too powerful. Suddenly these people, it like, opened up their anatomy. And I think that's a fearful thing. And I, I don't know what you guys think, is that it, maybe it's too emotive in a way. Although I think I've managed to refine it the past five years. But do you think that sounds, if you were a big business leader, that you think, oh, I don't want my, I don't want my employees starting to, to feel to that level? I don't think that. I think, I think for me, I want to help people um, figure out roots to their feelings in a more profound way so that they can get actually in touch with what's going on inside. Um, more honest about that and it sounds like what you're doing it's it's a it's a moment of vulnerability perhaps in sharing what's most important or most most meaningful to them rather but it also feels like that exercise in connecting with what's truly going on inside of me and and creating a space where people share that um feels like it would add to the sense of psychological safety on the team and the sort of relational um, equity that really helps teams thrive. John, I don't know what you would say about it. I, I completely agree with all of that. And I think um, that's an enlightened view that many organizations probably don't, haven't got to yet. They probably want to um, because it's a deeply human experience and we need more, a more human kind of experience of one another but mm -hmm. people haven't been in in some organizations the culture has taught them to suppress their emotional responses as being things that stand in the way of clarity and logic and pragmatism um, which is quite frankly wrong in mm -hmm. the sense that, that, that our emotions teach us more about what's going on than, than you know many rational arguments can ever do so it gets the truth faster but I think as you you start to unlock that, you get this wave of and hope that, ah, that's what's been missing all along. <laughs> this is the thing yeah. that we need. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, the, the description of that session and you, you kind of go, well, this has been absent, you know, five people in talking about things. I, I didn't know that about you. That, make, that makes mm -hmm. so much sense. I see you now. Mm -hmm. um, but I've never seen all of that stuff before. That's incredible. Such a short yeah. shortcut. <laughs> yeah, it really is. And I, I, may I just say something else? It's like it's double sight, like as it's double double ended. Because that's the deep part. But there's a, there's a part that that lives near the surface, which is about free thinking. It's about creating. It's about. Mm you know, living on the surface of your internal life and, and becoming a more effective working person. So, for example, I did a, I did my most recent presentation to a large corporation was a, a Unilever a couple of weeks ago. And I was part of a collaboration with these guys called the Creative Catalysts. And there was lots of art, studio, painting, drawing. And then I was the, the literature, poetry bit. Anyway, beforehand, this guy turned around, before we started, this, we were all in the hall, and this guy said to me, yes, I, I, I love, it's really nice, I love poetry, it's great. We've been talking about language a lot at our consultancy and changing the language in business. And I said, he said, you know, you mustn't say the word advice anymore, because it's patronizing to people. So advice is off the list. And I was like, okay, that's fine, I'm sure there's some words that we, 
maybe we could think about using differently. But I walked away and thought, okay, well, that's fine. If there's words we need to take away, then we need to start creating new ones. And it's up to the employees, you know, the people on the ground to think of what that language is going to be. And the way to, for them to think about the, the new language for the world, for work, whatever organizations, is to give them the power of their own internal language mm. and to increase the, the range of their fluency. And, and poetry is a very effective way to do that. There's a lot more pragmatism to this than I, than I would have thought of um, coming into this conversation. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's good. It's really good. I'm thinking. I of, can say some uh, flowery stuff too. Now you you you've, want, you've got no, no, no. This is no. This is fantastic because you've got my wheels turning about what this could could look like. Uh, anyway, would you share another piece with us? Yes, I think this would be a good time to um, recite a bit from a far greater poet than than me, who's also a great. Um, prose writer, D.H. Lawrence. And um, this is one of my favorite poems. And ironically, and maybe because, it's about uh, a man in Sicily, um, D.H. Lawrence, who lived in Sicily for a while. He loved Italy, you may, know, may or may not know. In fact, he wrote the most fantastic um, journals called Twilight in Italy about his love of Italy, which if you take to Italy with you, the whole place just kind of... <laughs> is set alight in even more colour than it already has. But um, he wrote this poem called Snake, and it's about him in his, in his little villa, and he comes out to use the water trough to fill up his water for the morning, and he sees a snake using the trough. And to me, this is it's about humility and your understanding your human nature, nature being the most important word in, that, in those two words. Snake. A snake came to my water trough on a hot, hot day, and I in pyjamas for the heat to drink there. In the deep, strange, scented shade of the great dark carob tree, I came down the steps with my pitcher and must wait, must stand and wait, for there he was at the trough before me. He reached down from the fissure in the earth wall in the gloom and trailed his yellow-brown slackness soft-bellied down over the edge of the stone trough and rested his throat upon the stone bottom and where the water had dripped from the tap in a small clearness he sipped with his straight mouth softly drank through his straight gums into his slack long body Silently. Someone was before me at my water trough, and I like a second comer waiting. He lifted his head from his drinking, as cattle do, and looked at me vaguely, as drinking cattle do, and flickered his two forked tongue from his lips, and mused a moment, and stooped, and drank a little more being earth brown, earth golden from the burning bowels of the earth on the day of Sicilian July with Etna smoking. The voice of my education said to me, he must be killed, for in Sicily the black, black snakes are innocent, the gold are venomous. And voices in me said, if you were a man, you would take a stick and break him now and finish him off. But I must confess how I liked him, how glad I was he had come like a guest in quiet to drink at my water trough and depart peaceful, pacified and thankless into the burning bowels of this earth. Was it cowardice that I dared not kill him? Was it perversity that I longed to talk to him? Was it humility to feel so honoured? I felt so honoured. And yet those voices, if you were not afraid, you would kill him. And truly I was. I was most afraid. But even so, honoured still more that he should seek my hospitality from out the dark door of the secret earth. 
He drank enough and lifted his head dreamily as one who was drunken and flickered his tongue like a forked knight on the air so black, seeming to lick his lips and looked around like a god, unseeing into the air and slowly turned his head and slowly, very slowly, as if thrice a dream, proceeded to draw his slow length curving round and climb again the broken bank of my wall face. And as he put his head into that dreadful hole, and his, as he slowly drew up, snake easing his shoulders and entered farther, a sort of horror, a sort of protest against his withdrawing into that horrid black hole, deliberately going into the blackness and slowly drawing himself after, overcame me now his back was turned. I looked round, I put down my pitcher, I picked up a clumsy log and threw it at the water trough with a clatter. I think it did not hit him, but suddenly that part of him that was left behind convulsed in undignified haste, writhed like lightning and was gone into the black hole, the earth-lipped fissure in the wall front, at which in the intense still moon I stared with fascination. And I immediately I regretted it, I thought how paltry, how vulgar, what a mean act. I despised myself and the voices of my accursed human education. And I thought of the albatross and I wished he would come back, my snake. For he seemed to me again like a king, like a king in exile, uncrowned in the underworld, now due to be crowned again. And so I missed my chance with one of the lords of life and I have something to expiate, a pettiness. Thank you. What makes that your favorite? Apart from The Lady of Shalott. Um, the clarity of the construction of the thoughts, mm -hmm. the painted stillness of somebody standing in a moment in their own lives, which is like a thousand moments, the significance of the other, you know, that there is this other whole world outside of yourself that brings you to yourself. And I love Sicily. And I love T.H. Lawrence. So. <laughs> this relationship to animals is really fascinating. You know, the, the mixture of kind of love and admiration and guilt and unknowing and, mm -hmm. um, you know, because I've got a cat. And um, it's, a, it's a rescue cat. And he was traumatized by former um, owners who, who left him in a def desperate state. And um, his ability to trust um, people, um, it was very, very low. And it's taken a lot of love, particularly my daughter's attentions for him to... to and, and so that, that, that's a very fragile relationship we have with this creature and it's it's wonderful um but you can just feel this torrent of emotions mm. you want you want them to love you and you want you want to love them and, and they but when something can't trust you that's an amazing feeling of spectrum of different things going on um and yes it's a venomous snake but it's not this this idea that to be a man you must kill it you must, you know, yeah. that, <laughs> that's really interesting. Also, of course, as every poet knows and every um, novice poet or about to be poet lover knows, that that is also, he's describing himself. Yeah. That snake is a part of who he is. Yeah. And it's in all of us and we just try to deny it. We're, we're fascinated on, on The Evolving Leader about the role of emotion and leadership. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about your kind of relationship with your emotions and how that's changed as you've developed? Oh, my God. I'm, I'm quite shut down emotionally. And that's probably hard to believe um, because I am a poet. But the reason I'm a poet is because I am shut down emotionally. <laughs> mm. And I'm shut down emotionally because 
partly because my mother said when I was born, I was so sensitive. It's like I'd been born without a skin. And I think I understand that now. I am very sensitive. I'm, I'm incredibly porous. So somebody said to me once, Pele, when you walk into a room, I don't know how you survive because I know that you're reading every single person. You're absorbing all their personalities at once. And, you know, I, I didn't want to sound naff, but I did, when you were reading out, the, kindly reading out those lovely testimonials people have written about me, I did want to say, yeah, my students are my books. You know, mm. I read, I read, I read. So I think I've spent a lot of time sublimating my emotions and that keeps me safe. But mm. I think, I, 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 think I, I, I pay my debt to being <laughs> slightly emotionally guarded because... Or, or completely numb, I don't know which one it is, because I, I'm, I'm immersed in this extraordinary language of the soul on, on my own behalf and of, of those I love and others who are interested. So. so just to understand that a little bit more, because that's, I suppose the immediate reaction is very counterintuitive, but as somebody who is very sensitive to what's going on, who sees the the kind of, for want of a better word, the truth of situations. He sees, sees more than other people and feels more than other people. Um, when you say you're sublimating or suppressing those emotions, are you, are you really doing that or are you just kind of holding them a little bit at bay so that you can understand them better? I don't, I'm not trying to interpret what you're doing, but it, it does feel sure. that there can't be an absence of emotional responses to what you're doing because... Sure, I think, um, well, mo you know, first of all, you know, I'm, you know, you say that I, I understand better than everyone else and, and, and maybe I do, but I, I must say that, that, that that's because I've dedicated, you know, like 25 years of my life to emotion and other people's, my own, the great dead artists and the, the way that they've channeled that. And um, I think... It's very difficult doing what I do because I don't have any of the home comforts around me. I mean, I just got married three years ago. Uh, I only met him three and a half years ago. Um, I'm 51. I don't have any kids. And I don't have any money ever. You know, and so I, I'm constantly living on the edge of myself and my life and my passion. And it's really hard. Um, so it's not like if I was very rich in money, I'm rich in words, obviously already, you know, I would, I would, I would go away to a big hotel, very expensive <laughs> for about six months and sit there and feel, you know, feel my bloody feelings, but I don't have, I mean, it sounds so naff and I hope you understand what I mean when I say I don't have that mm -hmm. luxury yet. Yeah. Yeah. So while I'm waiting, I'm just going to, you know, share it, share what I've got. Maybe some stuff will come back to me. <laughs> you know, in the meantime, it doesn't need to because it's so great just like it is. Like talking to you guys is a perfect example. If you're enjoying The Evolving Leader, please head over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a review. And don't forget to follow along on Instagram and LinkedIn. You can find us at Evolving Leader. Thank you for listening. Now, let's get back to the show. You have a really uh, wonderful blog site. Um, I was having a look, and one title in particular caught our eyes, The Importance of Poetry in a Tech World. And you asked the pointed question, can the utterance of a poet have any more relevance than the extraordinary impact of social media? <laughs> can, can you talk to us well, a little bit about that? All the right questions, guys, because I've written on my notes that Elon Musk... <laughs> What a clever guy he is. I mean, whether I like him or not, I don't really mind about that. But um, freedom of speech, this all comes back to poetry. You know, that's what poetry is. It's freedom of speech. And I, yeah. I'm a great, I really believe in it. And I believe if you educate people in great literature, you know, great things that have gone before, ways of thinking, then you can let pe set people free to have the freedom to say what they want and that the problem is is that people don't know how to say what they want because they've stopped looking back 
behind the, over their shoulders at what went before. So when Elon Musk said on Twitter the other day, um, the bird has been set free from the cage, I, I wondered how many other people thought, oh, I know why the cage bird sings. May Angelou, how fantastic. Does he know he's alluding to a great poem when he, when he writes that profound thing down? And that if he did know how far he could take that, you know, that's so exciting. So for me, tech and poetry are very aligned if you inform the people with the tech, you know, with the desire to be in that landscape. Mm. They can become the same thing. It's interesting because he's just changed his Twitter um, profile. <laughs> What is it? To, it's um, it's a picture of him as a kid with a uh, with the phone. It says Twitter complaint hotline operator, and his location is hell. <laughs> well, I hope he's read yeah. Dante's Inferno then. <laughs> yeah, you see, this is you know. <laughs> if he's going to say that, he has to have read Dante's Inferno. It's just the little, and he's got the he's obviously got the the blue tick as well, which is you know. <laughs> <laughs> I hope he's paying his uh, his subscription for it. Shall we pause there and get another reading from you? Sure. I just bought this. It's by a guy called Ian Crichton Smith, who's quite a famous writer and journalist, but he's also a poet, and I never knew that. And I opened it at this page, and this is a sonnet, by the way. It's called Death and the Politicians. Couldn't be more apposite to now, I tell you. The politician's gesture in this bland and azure summer superficies of the mind slumbering in its folded leaves. None shall speak of the black, implacable star beyond the manifestos of the day that's unappeased by buttonhole or rose. As if the floating vote should Charon's boat guide with its souls to a benignant heaven those dim majorities on the other side, and none shall mention that rotating vase, constituent of no politics, but made out of speech, not out of speech, but silence and deep shade. Mm. That's just the most beautiful last stanza, and none shall mention that rotating vase, constituent of no politics, but made not out of speech but silence and deep shade. Love it, love it. So, Pelly, can we turn to some of your recent work that you've done, particularly some of the things that you've done in lockdown, which have been quite extraordinary? Sure. So the great romantic poets are one of my great passions, and I work a lot on trying to teach in the now how incredibly profound they still are to the now. Um, I'm about to make a film about Shelley, um, who people think was a womanizer and was difficult to understand. Actually, Shelley was one of the great, great activists of history. And um, he wrote The Mask of Anarchy, which is a poem written about the Peterloo Massacre. Um, I, I please recommend you all go and just find it online. And it's packs a punch. Anyway, so I'm making this film. And the reason I'm making this film about Shelley to try, he was also a vegetarian and, and one of the first great environmentalists. Um, he was just so ahead of his time. Um, it's because before Shelley died, Keats died, and John Keats died of tuberculosis 200 years ago, uh, last February. And um, he died at age 24. He, he, was a, he, was, he was a pharmacist in London, worked at Guy's Hospital, worked in the operating theatre, and he was so sensitive... I'm not as sensitive as he was, that he, could, uh, he couldn't bear the blood and the operations. And he decided that poetry was as much a medicine, a, a balm, or a healing cure for human, humanity as uh, medicine was. And wrote these, started to write these great poems. He wrote six of the greatest poems ever written in the space of, I think it's three months. And they're his odes, Ode to Autumn, Ode on a Grecian Urn, uh, to name but... Uh, name but a few so um he is a great voice of today and the fact that he died his bicentenary was during this terrible pandemic and he died of tb was extraordinary so i was meant to do a live event about him and i said look let's make a film because we can't do it like the script that i wrote about his dying days 
And by the way, I didn't write any of the script. I compiled the poems and letters of the time to make this meta-narrative, which is far more powerful than anything I'd write. And um, they said, no, just wait till the pandemic's over. Don't make a film. And I, I said, so I just made the film anyway. And the reason I'm telling you the story is because it was lockdown. All the great culture giants had gone to sleep. All the museums were shut, all the theatres were shut. So all the great, the great culture heroes didn't have any work. And um, I have a great friend called Nick Rowe, who's been in this, been in this performance about Keats before, plays Seven, who was the carer. It's a great, great illustration of palliative care. This man, an artist, came with Keats to Rome and thought he was going to advance his painting career, and instead he just realized he was in the company of a genius who wasn't going to live the next few months, and cared for him, and loved him. Um, and uh, so he, he played seven before, and he was playing him again, and he happened to be really close friends with Damien Lewis. So he rang Damien up and said, would you like to play Shelley? And Damien said yes. And then I have another great actor playing... Um, Keats, and there was an actor reading the poem called Simon Maniander. And um, they all just filmed themselves on their phones, in their houses, on, the, on their whatever, cameras, sent me in the footage, and we made this film about Keats's dying days. And it's as if they're in the same room, because they constructed the light. They were so clever, the candles and the position in the room makes it look like it's a 200 years ago guy staring down another 200 years ago guy in the same room. And it's, in the, and it's now, happening now, and it's 200 years later and everyone's in separate houses. And it's happening in four different countries. And it was watched by 4,000 people, all in separate houses, on their computer screens, on the exact time of the exact day that he died 200 years before, during a pandemic. It's amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. I, please watch it if you haven't. So, yeah, was, we'll, we'll we'll put a link to the uh, to the, the film great. on and, and, the show. And just to say, another extraordinary example of the power of collaboration when you all have one 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 message that you want to convey and you all feel so passionately about it. You all look at it from different angles. My husband helped me do it. We had a the editor was the manager at the local Starbucks in Ludlow. <laughs> Movie stars. You know, well, it, it really helps when you've got someone as famous as Damon Lewis. Right. It really uh, does help. But yeah. the, the other beauty is such it was so democratic. There was nothing. There was no budget. We did it on no money. There's no star, you know, except Keats. He was the obvious star to all of us. It was just very the equilibrium of it was extraordinary. Yeah. Can we talk about Freeze as well? Yes, I met. Uh, professor in Rome when I was doing this residency we got together and he, he st was a professor at Stanford and he said why don't you just come to Stanford with me so I packed all my bags and went to live at Stanford University and um and I got this phone call from an architect friend of mine he said Pele I'd like you to do a freeze a poem freeze for this development the old um, Chelsea Barracks site which is the site that uh, Prince Charles intervened about because he, Norman Foster like made this huge eyesore of the sacred site. So um, ten years later, Qatari Dia had got the commission, and um, I had to think of a freeze poem, three thousand characters long, that would run along four walls, um, and I had to do it in three months. It's another thing that my husband helped me with, <laughs> and. Uh, I put pieces of paper along our apartment in San Francisco as if the apartment walls were the freeze and just wrote this poem around it. And now it's there in, in um, Chelsea, Chelsea Bridge Road, shining against the plane trees in different light. There's three layers to the poem. And it's, it's about nature. It's about the, po the history of gardens using poetry. And like the, there's the wall that looks out over the Chelsea pensioners' um, the beautiful Chelsea pensioners um, complex and the other wall looks over the Thames and the other wall looks towards the Chelsea Physic Garden and each wall has its own character but it's built of poems by great poets it's called a cento so I wove it's just an old classical form so you take poems fragments from other poems and you weave them into a bouquet of one whole poem 
and it's it's uh, very easy to find because it's you just get off at Sloan Square Station, yeah. Sloan Square Station, don't you? And it's a few minutes yes. walk from there. Yeah, and it's it's really beautiful. It, it, it's and it, it it's it's beautiful because it's carved out of Portuguese limestone for all eternity, and the, and the words glisten like like objects of your imagination, like and it's written in three three rows so you as the viewer can pick the word to make your own poem so it's not it's not necessarily linear you can you can take clutches and make your own flower bouquet i thoroughly recommend going to see it because uh, I, I i went there a few weeks ago and it was it's wonderful oh, you've seen um, it yeah i'm yeah. sorry did you like it i loved it yeah no, i <laughs> took my daughter there we had, we went and uh, walked around and, and looked at it yeah so that was it's wonderful to end, could we could we get another one of your pieces of work um, to send us on our way? Yes, this is another one from my juvenile. It's not particularly pleasant, but it does talk about how 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 words again you can just construct if you understand how a poem is built and you understand feeling, you can just put some words together and make something completely radical. Um, and it's called swelling. And I had this huge cyst on the side of my nose. I don't know where it came from, but it was the whole side of my face swelled up. And um, I asked someone from, for directions and they ran away. <laughs> it was that bad. So I was sitting at the bus stop and I thought, this is crazy. Um, I'm going write, to write this down. And this is what I wrote. Swelling. This new slow, shrill drum along the bone wakes something and digs in and a new nudity comes fevered, flushed and shy it's rude revealing this face so scorched and high rising across the cheek one famished oriental eye here on the weeping side so swelling digs in and I'm craving a veil for this wedding of swelling to skin, a red one for its burning visions long. Pele, thank you for sharing some of your work with us and for inspiring us. Um, how, how might somebody get in touch with you that would be interested in running a workshop with you? Oh, that's a nice question. <laughs> Um, hopefully my website works. <laughs> um, actually, I've called it Blossom, which I, I don't know if I should change, but my consultancy and workshop offerings is called Blossom, and it's on the website. And my, my, my email should be there. Thank you. We'll put a link in the, the show details to that as well. Thank you for asking. Hello, thank, thank you so much. Thanks, um, guys. It's been a joy. I'm really a really restoring experience talking to you. And, I only um, wish we'd been yeah. in the same room together. Yeah, <laughs> I know. But um, you, you've, um, I think you're going to make the weekend better for both Scott and I as a result. <laughs> That's of, so nice. Uh, Thank you. Me too. Absolutely. Lovely way to Keep finish. reading, guys. And for our listeners, remember, the world is evolving. Are you? Are you?